just to preference things, if I sound a little different or off during this video, I apologize. I've been dealing with a bunch of different mouth problems recently that have prevented me from making videos, so uh, it shouldn't be too bad. But again, if I sound off at all during this video, I apologize. So uh, I'm glad to see you guys again, and I will see you guys in the spotlight. So please enjoy the video. Thank you. See you. <laughs> Here we are again. Welcome, welcome back. We're at it again. We covered the first two seasons of Barney and Friends from 1992 and 1993, as well as the video specials that took place the year following. In 1995, Barney the Dinosaur would be back home and on television once again for a new set of 20 episodes. This is probably the one I've been looking most forward to for this series. Does it hold up? Let's take a look, get comfortable, grab a snack or two, or something, I, I don't know. <laughs> and set the stage as we dive into Barney and Friends, the third season. Season 3 is the most accurate example of a refresh that you can imagine. The intro animatic gets fully updated with a really funny yet confusing few frames of animation, while the opening theme remains the same. The set also sees a whole new look. It's important to note that both seasons 1 and 2 of the series were filmed at the Color Dynamics studio in Dallas, Texas. The show would then move to a new studio in Las Colinas, meaning that an entirely new studio space would be put to use giving the school setting a bunch more space to work with. The tree is still there, the tree stump is still there, and the wooden playset would also be there, but with a slight freshening up. Just about every issue I had with how the previous season went about the look of the school area has been alleviated with the use of this new studio space. Neither the outside nor the inside feel cramped, and the lighting is so, so much better. Bright, it's spacious, and it feels a bunch more lively without necessarily having to add anything super substantial. Everything is just absolutely beautiful. The tree leaves, and the bushes are so green, and the grass. By far the biggest addition to this set is the newly built treehouse setting. In the first episode, during a Jack and the Beanstalk inspired segment, the kids climb a tree meant to represent one of the beans planted by Jack, in this case, Sean. At the top, we enter a large treehouse fitted with furniture and a wraparound staircase. This is honestly something the show needed and adds just an extra area for the production crew to play around with. I love it. Nothing too crazy, but the classroom is also visually different. Things have of course moved around and with an extra amount of space, there's more room to breathe life into the indoor setting. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The way the familiar locations look here compared to the past season is such a massive step up, even if it is still meant to be the same school. Now let's talk about the dinosaurs. By no means is this anything close to a video on costume evolution, but being as the show refreshed itself so much, I'd be silly not to mention anything related to the way they look now. But I'll keep it as brief as I can, and we'll also discuss the characters themselves as we move down the line. Barney is who we'll talk about last. BJ! As you may recall, in 1993, BJ was introduced into the show's second season as Baby Bop's six-year-old sibling. Being that he's the elder brother, the idea was to design him taller, being at about Barney's height. However, this idea would quickly be rethought as in 1994 during the New York City live shows as well as the NBC special Barney's Imagination Island. BJ's base design would remain largely the same but with the character having been shrunken down, now being only slightly taller than his younger sister. Now, in 1995, BJ appears in season 3 with an entirely new base design, a new head sculpt, and a new body to better allow for movement. BJ is performed by suit actor Jeff Brooks, who first took the helm as BJ in Barney's Imagination Island after Jenny Dempsey. It's honestly crazy to me to think that the production crew wanted Baby Bop tall and then decided against it to better suit her age and then added another dinosaur character and had the exact same change of heart again. BJ here looks so sleek and well-imagined and wonderful. BJ is now fitted with a head-bobbing mouth mechanic that looks really silly but is insanely practical and I love it. Baby Bop would also receive a bit of a makeover. 
no longer with her big round eyes beating out at you. Her face is lifted upward and she's got a little mouth mechanism just like her brother. Both siblings feel perfectly integrated into the episodes they're a part of, sharing a fair amount of screen time between them both, and are an absolute delight to see when they appear together. BJ has episodes heavily featuring him, such as the firefighter episode, and an episode in which he loses his hat. And Baby Bop has episodes with her influence in mind, such as classical cleanup, where she helps clean the classroom after her mess. Kindest, happiest, and best friends! Me. Oh my god, I've said so many times before, but this is by far, in my own opinion, the best that Barney the Dinosaur has ever looked. The Backyard Gang, the movie, and anything past this season, even today. Before this, David Joyner had utilized the exact same costume from 1991 that was introduced towards the end of Barney and the Backyard Gang. By 1993, the suit seemed to be nearing its end, the arms yellowing due to sweat buildup, the fleece worn and balling up so much that it's visible and almost distracting in the finale of Barney and Friends Season 2. The costume had been in two Backyard Gang home videos, live performances, daytime appearances, 50-something episodes of the TV series, you name it. Barney's Imagination Island was the first to introduce a newer look for Barney in a home video format, which then carried over into Barney Live in New York City. But Season 3 Episode 1 would be the first time we'd see it for the TV series. It's beautiful, it's sleek, he no longer has that rigid boxy and angled appearance, and he's just cleaner. My only slight gripe is that there are times where it looks as though you can barely make out the mouth movements, but that's a very small thing. In season 2, I took a bit of an issue with the over-energetic nature that Barney would exert at times. But this is no longer a problem. Barney is at a perfect level of excitement throughout here, and I never felt as though he was doing too much or being as overbearing as before. When I say this set of episodes was a breath of fresh air, I truly mean it. While I enjoyed season 2 quite a bit, I feel as though with season 3, Barney being slightly toned down made the watch through more enjoyable. He's still super jolly and giddy and excitable exactly as he should be. Pumpernickel bread. Pumpernickel. <laughs> but he's also soft and caring when he needs to be. Would that be okay, Barney? Oh, well, Carlos, puppies need lots of love and attention. And if he stayed at school, he'd have to be all alone all night because everyone goes home. The kids are the kids, and you know what, I'm probably going to end up saying less about them as time goes on. They're always the same, really. I mean, there's not really too much to say, like, at all. Carlos is now part of the main cast after the New York City live shows, and his brother Juan comes with them. Feels fairly obvious that Juan was added in order to fill the sibling dynamic of the human characters after both Tina and Lucy had left the series. I like Juan, but the problem I felt is that there's always some sort of slight conflict whenever he's around. I understand the point is siblings won't always get along, but there were times where it felt every episode they were in together, there would be some sort of conflict. Hey, I saw it first, Carlos. No way, I saw it first. Come on, that's not fair. It's just interesting because as far as I can remember, Tina and Lucy very rarely were ever shown to have any sort of conflicts with each other. Same with BJ and Baby Bob. It's nothing huge, just something I realized while watching. While many kids return from season 2, Michael is no longer part of the main cast, and as mentioned earlier, Tina would also move on along with Derek, who'd both have somewhat of a send-off episode later in the season. Certain new characters including the twin sisters Ashley and Alyssa and Steven were essentially brought in to get viewers familiar with their faces. As in the season following, the main cast we'd known for the better majority of the last few seasons would no longer be on the show. These new characters don't really have many lines or any real episodes where they serve as important at all. And yep, they're, they're the kids, alright. I was mainly just happy to see my favorite characters come back, like Min, Tasha, Sean, and Kathy. The biggest addition to the character roster has got to be the introduction of Stella. I hear someone say something about flying? Why, I have a wonderful story about flying! <laughs> Stella the Storyteller is a woman who appears from a magical door from time to time. She and Barney are good friends and she's known as a traveler, always bringing her suitcase and different outfits with each arrival. Stella appears to tell stories to the gang whenever she stops by, and this is something the show absolutely benefited from. Stella just being around acted as a nice little cooldown period. She's played by the late Phyllis Cicero, whose talent should not be underplayed. Her acting is phenomenal, not only in its naturality, but in her physical mannerisms as well. 
We all remember having stories read out to us in our younger school years, whether it be by the teacher themselves or a guest in the classroom, and Stella emulates that to a T. She puts on voices, adds her own gestures, and uses items from her travels as part of the stories she presents. Well, Paolo was standing there with a big smile on his face, and the king said, why are you so happy? And Paolo said, I'm happy because I'm working in my bakery. Her presence always brought a smile to my face, as it never felt like a hindrance. It was never, ugh, we're doing this again. It was always, oh, Stella, I didn't think she'd be in this episode. Having that almost motherly figure in the form of a main recurring cast member was so, so nice. Also, Mr. Boyd was cool too. Mr. Boyd is a janitor that appears in the series. I didn't put him in the script um, because he appears in like one episode, maybe two. I don't remember. I, I only remember him from one. And he doesn't really do anything super like interesting, I guess. But yeah, he's he's cool. <laughs> Music is wonderful as it normally is. Being that their library is super strong by this point in the show, a ton of new songs are brought back, not even remade or anything, but pulled directly from the past couple of seasons, and I did not mind this at all. They're iconic and perfect just as they have been. It's funny because I actually didn't really enjoy a lot of new songs introduced for this season. There were songs that felt as though they were trying too hard to be a good song. I know coming up with music in a timely manner for a show like this has to be taxing, and it's unfortunate that not many of these new tracks were winners. One in particular, I had a really hard time trying to understand what they were even going for in terms of what the song was even intended to sound like. Oh, the mail. Yes, the mail. It's fun to put a letter in the mailbox. Some songs I just found to be like flat out awful. He's my brother, my brother, my brother. But uh, again, not every song is going to be a winner. There were some that kind of hit, and I was just happy to hear my favorites make a return. And they always come in twos, one, two. We've got shoes. <laughs> I Love You is just as nice as before, and they've even gotten a lot better at transitioning into the song itself from normal dialogue. We can all find a way to help each other every day. It's just another way of saying, I love you. Barney, from a music standpoint, is something I think you'd really have to try to mess up entirely, and I think this season did fine enough. I have to be honest with you all, I have been savoring this watch through. As we've looked across each season one after the other, it was inevitable that we'd trek across familiar ground. It's obvious that certain topics explored before would see use once again, and that's fine. That's what's going to happen with a show like this. However, season three jumps out at me in that out of everything we've looked at so far, it feels the most structurally sound. It's become less about the topic being focused on and more to that of the way it's handled and taught differently. Some episodes also just resonate with me, not specifically because of the main topic, but the vibe and flow of everything in general. Episode 1, Sean and the Beanstalk, may just be the biggest example of this. I sure wish you'd hurry up and grow big and tall. <laughs> is this big and tall enough, Sean? <laughs> Sean ponders on why his plant isn't growing nearly as fast as those owned by his fellow classmates. As the gang comes together, Barney and friends learn about plant life and what vegetation needs in order to grow. The episode ends with Barney and friends' newfound knowledge on the growth process of plants and Barney having his own pot of flowers with his name written on top. The flow of this episode in terms of writing and song introduction is so smooth and happy. I honestly hope my bias towards the songs used isn't influencing my thoughts on this, because that's not really fair. <laughs> but then again, this is my review, meaning my opinion is the ultimate opinion, so... I mean, we go from songs like Growing... To Mr. Sun... Shine down on me. 
to the raindrop song. I don't care if it never stops how I love the raindrops. And everyone just seems so happy, Barney included, of course. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Again, the topic itself is wonderful, yet the composition surrounding it is what makes it so much better. One thing I noticed about season three is that while Barney still maintains his mentor teacher like role, this is the first time I noticed the kids actually sort of playing with him. But Hedge, they always play with Barney. That's the whole point. He's, he's at the school and it's in the theme song. Yes, Squidward, but listen, hear me out. <laughs> there are moments where the kids will interact with Barney as if he's one of their friends, as in their human friends. It's not even anything super substantial, nothing huge to point out, but just small bits of dialogue and physical action that make him feel less like this extraordinary being and more that of a classmate or a stuffed animal being toted around. We have lots of fresh air out here, Barney. Oh, we sure do, man, but all this spinning is making me dizzy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's something I noticed as early as the first episode where I felt something different was happening in terms of how everyone talked to Barney or addressed him. We're going to surprise you, Barney. Okay. <laughs> and don't peek. Oh, I promise I won't. I promise. Oh, oh, oh. Again, it's, it's something small, but something that adds on to the series. It's... It's polished, and I think that's what matters most over everything, is that this season feels very well polished. Pretend you hear two babies crying, Barney. <clears throat> I think I hear a baby crying. Two babies, Barney? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think I hear two babies crying. It also feels as though they enjoy finding new ways of telling a story, as each method implemented before is melded together here at different points. One of the kids will read a storybook with the rest of the gang, Barney will read a story at times, the kids will act out a skit in order to tell a story, and puppet shows would return as well. However, now, with the addition of Stella the Storyteller, we have a whole new way of being able to get a story out of the way, and more to play around with in general. Where in season one I felt this to be a chore, it now feels like a genuine piece of each episode that I welcome fully and wholeheartedly. We get a variety of new things to talk about this time around. There's an episode solely tailored to firefighting, one that's involving what it's like to be at a grocery store, and even an episode focusing on something as minuscule as shoes and the different kinds there are is something to smile at. There's a lot to love and not too much to say in ire. I think my main gripe with season three is the moments in which the show seemed unsure of just what it wanted to do. The episode It's Raining, It's Pouring being a big example. The crew think of rainy day activities. Tasha tells a story. The late Tommy DePaola comes out and reads a story that he wrote and then they act out another story. Going into the treehouse after the rain, they set up circus-like decorations in order to have men do one 30-second interpretive dance sequence, and then the entire bit is finished. Only throwing salt into the wound, Baby Bop appears, but only for this segment, literally meaning that she exists in the episode to be part of the audience for a minute and a half, and then just goes away. Episodes like this are few and far between, but are the least impactful out of this run of episodes, as it feels as though the production was essentially just trying to get something on air. Season 3 does carry its share of soft, loving moments, just as the past couple would. In the episode, A Welcome Home, Min shows off a dog being put into adoption, to which Julie relays that she is also adopted. Later in the show, Julie sings a song called Someone to Love You Forever a new song written for the series expressing her sympathy with the animal over its adoption. When you reach out to me, I will always be someone to love you forever. While I'm not the biggest fan of the new track, the sentiment is something beautiful that I understand and appreciate. The episode On The Move introduces a new character, Kenneth, as the new kid at the school, but also serves as the final episode featuring both Tina and Derek. The gang whip up a scrapbook with old photos of everyone together. It warms my heart not only getting to see these characters again, but the fact that they got an entire episode tailored to their departure is so sweet. This is the part where I briefly speak about the season finale, but this time around, while there is of course a last episode, it's not as definitively a finale as before. Whereas before, the season finale would feature a loose theme centered around the importance of family, or that everyone is special, season three episode 20 instead focuses on airport manners and flying in general. It's different, but I love that we got an episode talking about something like what it's like to be at an airport. Again, it's, 
it's something different, but it's something interesting, and that's all I could really hope for. Barney and Friends Season 3 would run its 20 new episodes from February to October of 1995. While not part of the TV series, the various Barney Home Video VHS releases put out around this time are often looped in with this season, being that the intro sequence maintains the same structure as well as the same set being returned to. There were a lot of home videos being produced around this time, including Barney's Talent Show, Barney's Fun and Games, Barney's 1, 2, 3, 4 Seasons, Barney's Sensational Day, and more. Season 3 of Barney and Friends should be remembered not only for the content of its episodes, but also for just how much of an improvement it proved to be on the series as a whole for its time. It knew what it wanted to do, how it wanted to communicate its messages, and how it should teach its viewers. This would be the last time much of the series' main cast would serve as part of the main cast, as mentioned earlier, and I'm glad they were such a big part of my life. The feel of Season 3 is unlike anything before. The confidence the show had in itself was just a joy to witness. Barney's come a long way since his television debut, both on and off screen. Although Barney and Friends would continue for long after 1995, seasons 1 through 3 are generally solidified as the golden years of the show. The Lions era, if you will. Having this early section of the show's history as part of my own history is something I'm forever grateful for as it greatly helped shape me and who I am today. It's had its ups and it's had its downs, but in the end, I still love Barney. At the time of this recording, it's currently April 6, 2022, making it the 30th anniversary of Barney and Friends to this day. It should not be understated how much the character has done for pop culture, for our culture, public television, kids television, and everyone across the world. I want to send a special thank you to the cast and production and crew of Barney and Friends for the past 30 years, anyone that may have had involvement in the series, for doing so much for us and my own childhood. Uh, I want to send a special thank you also to my patrons, Emilia and Cameron, and the rest of my lovely patrons for supporting me in this series. Oh, Pumper, a big hug!